Who doesn't look forward to the first spring wildflower blooms after the cold of winter is finally gone? Some of the first flowers to be seen in the woodlands of eastern North America are the showy white blooms of bloodroot, Sanguinaria canadensis, a super interesting perennial spring ephemeral that can be found in woodlands and forests with rich, moist, well-drained soils from Canada all the way south to the Gulf Coast and from the Mississippi River Valley to the eastern seaboard. There are several reasons to like bloodroot both in the wild and as an addition to the pollinator garden. Of course, there are its stunningly beautiful blooms, which are brilliant white with bright yellow centers, and large for such a small plant, ranging from one to three inches in diameter. Bloodroot blooms in the early spring, usually March to April, but can vary depending on location. The bloom period is short, and bloodroot will normally be bloomed out in only a couple of weeks. Still, it is a stunning display while it lasts. The flowers don't produce nectar, but the pollen is gathered by a wide variety of native bees and even honeybees. The main pollinators of bloodroot are native mining bees in the genus Andrina and some of the early emerging species of sweat bees. If you love learning about early blooming native wildflowers like the bloodroot, channel your inner mining bee and pollinate that like button. Bloodroot foliage is unique and eye-catching and carries visual interest after the blooms have gone. The leaves are from three to six inches across and deeply lobed, with each leaf usually having from five to nine blunt lobes and may also have smaller blunt teeth along the edges. The upper surface is deep to pale green, sometimes with a grayish or bluish cast, and the lower surface is much paler green to whitish. As bloodroot is a spring ephemeral, the leaves will disappear by midsummer. Fun fact about bloodroot. Sanguinaria is a monotypic genus, which means Sanguinaria canadensis is the only species in that genus. There can be only one. If you caught that Highlander reference, let me know what your favorite Highlander moment was from the movies or the TV show, your choice. Bloodroot is not a large plant, ranging from three to 12 inches tall with about an equal spread. It is a colony forming plant spreading from both rhizomes and seeds and given time can fill a sizable area. The fleshy rhizomes, along with the leaves and stems, contain red, acrid sap, which is where the name bloodroot comes from. The sap is toxic if ingested, and can even be harmful if in contact with the skin for too long. Although it does have antibacterial properties and was once used in anti-plaque mouthwash and toothpaste. That is, it was, until it was discovered that putting bloodroot in your mouth is not the best idea. Just be careful when handling bloodroot rhizomes and wash up afterwards. Probably the biggest hurdle to growing bloodroot in your pollinator garden is finding it for sale. Seeds are tough to find for sale as they must be hand collected. Bloodroot seeds form in pods that split open and spill the seeds when they are ripe. The pods can't be collected before this happens, so the pods either must be bagged in mesh so the seeds are trapped, or the plants must be monitored closely so the seed collection can be timed. Needless to say, you are not likely to find any place selling large amounts of bloodroot seed. Root cuttings are the most economical way to start a bloodroot plot and are usually not too hard to find. Sometimes potted container stock can be found also, although it's gonna be more pricey. Just be sure you're getting your root cuttings or your container stock from a reputable native plant nursery that is propagating them and not digging them out of the wild. I mentioned many bee species in my videos, and if you would like to learn more about the bees that happen to be in your yard, I recommend the book, Bees, an Identification and Native Plant Forage Guide by Heather Holm. This book covers native bees and introduced species in detail, including size, when they are active, life cycle, where they nest, and how they collect pollen, and even has a section covering common native forage plants for each bee. There are sections devoted to many species of native trees, shrubs, and herbaceous plants that bees use. At the time of recording, this book cost around $22, which I think is a great value. I will put a link to where you can purchase this book in the description. The way bloodroot seeds get dispersed is super cool. After the pods split open and the seeds spill out, they are carted away by ants, a process known as myrmecockery. You may be wondering, why does an ant have an interest in a bloodroot seed? Well, the bloodroot baits the ants. Each seed has a fleshy appendage called an oleozome, which the ants find tasty. So the ants come along, collect the seeds, haul them away to their nest, and store them until they want to eat the oleozomes that are on them. After they chow down on the oleozomes, they still have a seed to deal with. The seed itself is of no use to the ants, so they see it as garbage, and they haul it off to their refuse pile and dump it where it gets buried. 
and it just so happens that an ant refuse pile is the perfect place for a bloodroot seed to germinate, which it does and completes its job of continuing the species. Nature is so cool. Bloodroot is a plant of the woods. It can handle deep to partial shade, which coupled with its ability to spread makes it a great choice for a shady area ground cover. Of course, there is the small problem of it disappearing completely by midsummer. So it should be coupled with another shade loving, woods growing native ground cover that grows throughout the spring, summer, and fall. Something like the easy to grow and beautiful wild ginger, which you can learn all about in this video and be sure to take some time and enjoy nature in your backyard.